going to start the program because it's, you, we want to get snappy, okay? And I hope you all have your food, and those that don't, you will be getting it. Um, Joyce Tennyson, I met because I went into Holden Lutz Gallery, and I saw this fabulous photography. And so Holden really introduced me to Joyce Tennyson who has become a quite illustrious photographer and well-known throughout the world and is in major museums. But instead of me introducing and talking about her, I asked Holden to do it because he is the expert. So Holden, please. Dale, I, 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 I will tell him. Dale, thank you for the lovely introduction and thank you for arranging this and inviting me here and inviting Joyce to speak. Also, thank you guys for having clapped for me. I, I can't remember the last time anybody clapped for me. I thought, what a strange thing, but it's so nice that people are actually enthusiastic about hearing me speak. And, I'm enthusiastic because I get to speak about somebody quite wonderful. Joyce Tennyson and I go back representing her artwork, her photography, uh, at least 20 years. For those who don't know me, my name is Holden Luntz, and we have a gallery on Worth Avenue, two galleries now, 332 Worth Avenue and 324 Worth Avenue, devoted to fine art photography. And 20 some odd years ago, I started to look at the work of Joyce Tennyson, made an introduction, started to bring, they were flowers at the time, but they weren't the kind of pretty flowers that you would think photographers would take. They were flowers almost as portraits. Uh, they were like understanding that nature has a life cycle and that everything that's sentient, everything that exists and is living goes through changes goes through birth, goes through life, goes through fulfillment and then, you know, and dies and, and new life happens. And I think with Joyce's work, I have to say, she's been a force in photography for over 40 years with major museum shows all over the world, not just in the United States, over 150 gallery shows, covers of Newsweek, covers of Life, covers of New York Magazine, covers of Esquire. She's literally, when they gave uh, awards for great photographers, they're the Infinity Awards and the Lucy Awards, and this is like the Academy and the Emmys. She took the Lucy Awards twice, she took the Infinity Awards, she's had Lifetime Achievement Awards, her specialty, though, is in portraits. And I would ask, when you listen to her talk and look at the work that she has taken over her career, I would ask that you reconsider the idea of what a portrait is. When people come into the gallery and say, can you find me somebody who will do their portrait, I always decline. Because now portraits are some kind of idea about you take pictures, you tell the photographer, got to light it right, you got to, you know, you got to Photoshop it, you got to take some of my years off me, don't make my nose look too big, or my hair, can't you do anything about my hair, or, so with social media in, and, and people's general sense of being self-critical, portraits weren't allowed to be what they should be. I think the interest in portraits and portrait photography is that a sense of a portrait is to use your eyes to look at somebody, but to understand more than what they look like. To get behind the facade of the face and the flesh and to understand what's inside a person. And when you look at a portrait, I don't think you want to look at somebody who has basically no action. I think you want to look at somebody and think deeper and think more about what they look like and think, what's the essence of this person? What does this person have that's unique in them that other people don't have? One last quick experience I'll share with you because I'm only supposed to speak for three minutes and I know 
I'm over. But the Four Arts did an exhibition of wise women. I didn't know the wise women show. The books are there for wise women. It was a book that came out. Nobody really knew that anybody would buy it. It's photographs of women, only women, 65 and older in the last third of their life. So the Four Arts did an exhibition, a traveling exhibition. This was had to be about at least 15 years ago, on wise women. And Joyce was busy. She was doing workshops. And so they called me and said, we need somebody to talk about the work and deliver a brief lecture. So of course I did. And But what was interesting to me is that was my experience with the pictures and the audience. There must have been 200 people that came, which sort of shocked me. I had to talk to 200 people. But I watched their response as they looked at pictures of women 65 years and older. And the, the concept was that people were no longer afraid of 65 years and older. These women had an inner beauty, had a radiance, had a sense of that life has given them this ex these experiences and they own these experiences. And these experiences are imprinted on their faces. And I don't know many photographers that could have been up for the challenge and could have done a job where you got the character, the quality, the strength, and what was special about each of the sitters, whether they were actresses, Supreme Court judges, civil rights activists, or just people that Joyce knew and people that she had special regard for. So you're in the presence of somebody really wonderful, really great, who has left an imprint on photography and really changed the horizon of what people think of when they think of portrait photography. So Joyce, your turn. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. I've been looking forward to being with you all today, and I want this to be an interactive kind of exchange. I'm going to unfold my story. It's been a long journey. I have been in photography for 50 years, and I would like you to think, I'm going to show you photos from the beginning of my life up until almost yesterday. And I'd like you to all think about your lives and the many chapters you've had and how you've grown and how you've, uh, you know, changed cities and countries and, and had, you know, so many experiences. So, okay, so I'm counting on you to help me make this interactive because that's what I really am interested in. This is an opening I had, a retrospective opening in Sweden, and I'm inviting you to the, this opening. I want you to see what it was like for me coming into this gallery. They were setting up for a sit-down dinner for 50 people who had uh, sponsored, helped sponsor the show. These, you'll see again some of these images uh, they're at a distance, I know, for you uh, all in the back. But look at this beautiful table. They had a celebrity chef. And I was greeted with my son and my granddaughter uh, and at the door with champagne and brought up to this room to see the installation before they opened the door. So this video was made seconds before the doors opened and allowed the 50 um, people to enjoy this celebrity dinner. And I'll talk more about the work, but you can imagine, because my grandparents were born in Sweden, what it was like for me to go back there and to have 
this huge show um, at this major museum. And because Sweden is so close to all the other capitals, 30,000 people saw this show. Um, and of course, I will show you the image they used to, to advertise the photo, and it was three stories high. They had chosen not one of these younger women, but a 92-year-old woman who was so engaging, and I thought it was so evolved of the Swedish public to want to have that three stories down. I had tears in my eyes when I got out of the uh, cab with my son and granddaughter and partner and uh, to see Mimi Waddell three stories high. She had passed away a couple years before that and it just gave me such joy. I'll show you. It's going to come later. So these were photographs from three of my books, Transformations, Light Warriors, and Wise Women. It took us two years to curate that show. I can't tell you, it was much worse than being pregnant and giving birth. It was so long. I'll just read that. My camera, well, whatever. I, <laughs> My I've always used my camera to get to know people. And the reason I became a photographer is because it gave me the opportunity to be close to people from all over the world. And to that's what really is, is you know, the most important thing for me in my life, because I love people, right? We like this. <laughs> All right. Well, good. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the favorite books that I've done. So you're going to have a walk through my career. I won't be able to... Uh, this is a multimedia show, and it's going to be fast-paced because I, I want to show you my favorite books, and there are a lot of them. <laughs> okay. So think about where did you grow up? This is where I grew up in Weston, Mass. I had a couple people here who are from Boston. And look at my family. What was your family like? Because my work is a lot like my, my roots. And when I did Wise Women, I photographed the great author Maya Angel Angelou. And I said to her, Dr. Angelou, um, what is most important in your life? And she looked at me like I should know the answer almost. And she said, why, Joyce, the journey. Because if you're not on the journey, you're not alive. And she's right. But everybody here I know is on the journey because you want to learn, you want to be exposed. And, and to me, so being on the journey is what has been most important in my life. I did a lot of really dumb things. Did anyone in here do yet dumb things when they were younger? Hello? <laughs> Hello? Like, I, I married, you know, five days after I graduated from college. And, uh, you know, giving up a scholarship for a PhD at Harvard to put my then husband through Georgetown Med. So I put my resume out. And the school that accepted me was Francis Junior High. I spent three years there as the only white teacher in the school. And I loved every single minute. And I think I learned a lot more than I would have learned in that PhD program. It was the year that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And our school was the uh, place where the National Guard set up. I still am emotional when I think of living through that. The town was burning, and my students were so frightened. And I had to be there and somehow try to, what could I do at any rate? Back then, I had dark hair. But when I started going gray, I decided 
blondes really did have more fun. I'm teasing. <laughs> I was lucky. I lived in D.C. And I got my master's by taking the bus um, for those three years where I taught uh, at GW. And then I moved up to college teaching. And this is my studio in D.C. At that time, I was just doing white-on-white -white images, mostly self-portraits. Uh, the Washington Post wanted to do a story on me, and I bought this suit because I thought I'd look more professional. Because normally I just, <laughs> I, I, I think I look ridiculous. <laughs> but at this time, I was doing very white on white, almost very, um, as Vicki Goldberg, the critic, says, almost like a, uh, you know, Renaissance uh, drawing. This is my son, Alex. You'll see him reappearing. Yes. You yeah, sure? No questions, but before. That's right. <laughs> this is the this is a cover of my um, uh, first book, Self Portrait. As I mentioned at that point, I had no idea who I was. I graduated from a small little girl's school, um, and I shouldn't be so, it was a wonderful school, but it was girls only and Regis College, outside of Boston. So uh, this is, I had a dream, I did a lot of my work through dreams, and I couldn't remember whether this bird cage was opened or closed. My mother died when she was 52, after she got her four children in college. My parents lived where, uh, you know, through the depression and they had nine and 10 children in their family. They couldn't go to college even when they got scholarships. They had to make money to put food on the table. So my mom got, you know, had got cancer, which, you know, I always have thought it's because of, you know, keeping herself hidden for so many years. These are just some self-portraits through the years. I particularly like this one. See, you can see going from 75, you know, these are my, my hippie days here. I'm teasing, of course. Um, 1998 is when I hit my stride in New York City, but you'll see a little bit more about that. I also, because I had done so many self-portraits, I was encouraged to do a book of my own work, but I knew from teaching that this was not any small kind of thing that women were doing self-portraits. I knew that it was a major, major upset in, in, in life, in a way like Black Lives Matter has been for us recently, thank goodness. But um, at any rate, this is pre-digital. I had a camera on a tripod and it's a dress that I inherited from my grandmother. I was lucky because I got a scholarship to spend a year in um, France uh, when I was 18. I wanted that so badly, that scholarship. I've wanted to grow and to, to be, I've always wanted to speak in my own voice and for, I had to become strong. And I know I told my mother I wanted to go to France and she needed to sign the application. She said, who are you to think you could win that scholarship? And I just signed her name. <laughs> and I've done a lot of that through the, is, because you know what? When you don't have other people who are going to stand up for you, you learn. I, I loved being in Europe. It just opened up the world of beauty and being in, in, in Europe and, and in Paris where the bridges had nude angels, statuary on everywhere. It became my spiritual country. And I've had a lot of opportunity to go back and uh, photograph and teach. These are just some, you know, random shots. My big, big break came when 
I was able to go to New York City. While I lived in um, DC, after I got my master's, I moved up to teaching at the Corcoran School of Art. And I had a cushy job, and I had shows, and I had done two books. But you know what bothered me? Think about it. I was a regional artist. I didn't like that. I wanted to be an artist that was international. And why not? Also, I got bad reviews in Washington because my work was too female. Yes, and so I didn't know, I, when I got that review, too female used to mean weak. I didn't think the work I was doing was weak. And I had studied with a protege of uh, Joseph Campbell, and he said, in the end, in art, what is most personal will be most universal. And I think that's true. So luckily, once again, I got a scholarship. I got a grant to use uh, the, you know, like within two months of landing in New York in a sublet, because I also got divorced, and my son was off at boarding school in Boston. I got there into the sublet and got a grant to use Polaroid's large camera. This is me next to the, cam uh, the camera. I was like a racehorse who had been let out of the gate. I was ready. And I also felt since I wanted to work with the figure that I was asking my subjects to be vulnerable. So I often, in the beginning of this three-year series, which became the book Transformations, I dressed like the subjects I was photographing to say, you know what? I'm in, we're in this together. Here I am looking at the big Polaroids, the way they come out. Holden Luntz has some wonderful, they're one of a kind, these large Polaroids. And they come out of the camera looking that size. You can see me standing back here. This is me. And pontificating. No, I'm just teasing. Um, but I've always had wonderful assistants. And um, at any rate, I loved this period in my, um, in my life. I felt like I had been let out of a kind of prison. And I was free to just be me. And uh, this is the only body of work that I've ever done where I really felt it was channeled. I just didn't intellectualize about it. But it got attention right away. Um, I used to get all of these uh, interns from the best photo schools, and they'd get 12 graduate credits for being in my studio. So I'd put the new ones on the... I, I wanted my figures to look like sculpture, so I made a combination of powder with limestone. I'm making a joke here. But I would put the poor little, you know, interns from, you know, L.A. or whatever into, like putting the powder on the models on the set. No, I'm teasing, but it, we had fun. There were a lot of us. Um, now, because I didn't have a trust fund and I didn't have a wealthy husband, I had to make my own um, mortgage payments. And I was really lucky that uh, because that, that work that became Transformations did seem to have never been done before. That style, that energy. It was uh, chosen to be on the cover of American Photo Magazine, which used to be a, a big magazine. And my phone started ringing after that. For, you know, just, not just for more shows, I was already in that world, but for every job, uh, for magazines, and also for very top um, advertising which is what really paid for my mortgage and my son's very expensive education. 
and because I, I am bilingual, um, I got a contract with French and Italian Vogue to work in Europe a lot. You can see what fun we're having. And in New York City, I always had these wonderful assistants. You know, sometimes I'd have, you know, because I'd always have three interns and then I'd had three full-time people. Here we are fo uh, photographing Al Hirschfeld from The New Yorker at age 99. And you know what? He would have made it to 100, but he went to the theater next week and couldn't get a cab and got a cold. So, but what a beautiful man. And look at the fun we're having. Here I am doing some more things. I also had a reputation for working very well with women, so I did a lot of celebrity portraits. This was for a uh, premiere magazine, uh, you know, big story on actresses. So Jodie Foster, being this very smart woman that she is, um, greeted me with, hello, boss. Was she threatened? No, she said, uh, she said, so what, what do you want me to do? I've looked at your website. Do you want me to take my clothes off? I said, well, since you're offering, yes. <laughs> so I was ready and had this cloth, and she went into the changing room and put the cloth over the private parts and came out. And she said, uh, I noticed that you said you could be done in about five minutes. I'm timing, laughing. You know, she wasn't being aggressive. Oh, yes, I think it could be four. So I just sent it her. I just said, you know, I really want to show what, a, what an unbelievably intelligent person you are. Of course, before I photograph anyone, I read a lot about them if they're a celebrity. And so I just said, just look me straight in the eye. And sometimes I'd ask my subjects to close their eyes and to go someplace that, you know, for one reason or another, I can lead them. Um, I said, just show me your inner power. Feel it and look at me. One, two, three, done. That's how quick it can be. Same thing here with Demi Moore. So I did a lot of celebrity. I have, I'm going to show you a whole collage of covers, but this was, I'm going to show you one of my most fun assignments. I went to um, Jordan to photograph the king and queen for the New York Times magazine. This was the cover, and uh, this was part of the insides. And when, you know, you think about it, the New York Times has such visibility around the world. And to get that assignment, oh, so nervous because the other thing is when you do a cover for you know particularly the New York Times magazine all your friends see it if you fall on your face you you know it's nerve-wracking but when I got there they wanted me to stand behind a rope you know like because there were you know like 50 photographers from around the world trying to get shots of the king for their and of course I told their PR person who I was dealing with that there was no way I could be one of those people standing behind a rope and that I would stay until he could find 10 minutes, she could find 10 minutes on his schedule to fit me in. So I went, uh, they did find on the fifth day that I could go and join him at his home before he uh, dressed for a black tie dinner. And he looked so uh, you know, tired. So. I said, your majesty, I can see how tired you are. And I said, I'm a certified Reiki master. Would you like me to help you with your shoulders? And I went and worked on his shoulders. I thought the PR woman was going to kill. Um, but as you know, I do what I want. And if it's in the service of my art. At any rate, I love you know working with celebrities. Ben Kingsley took me, uh, this was for a magazine, and he knew that I had a reputation of being, you know, knowing a little bit about women. And he said, you know, I'm on my fourth marriage and I don't want it to break up. And I, he, can I take you to dinner? Can you give me some secrets? We sat down and I said, how much younger is she than you? 
I said, oh dear, I think that may be the pro problem. Because you know what? And his, the wife before had left because she wanted her own career as a director. At any rate, so these are just fun little stories. This is an amazing story because I was hired by Fortune magazine and, you know, to do a cover story on Oprah Winfrey. And I was scheduled to photograph her on 9-11 in Chicago at Harpo Studios. And you always have to come back with three or four different things for a cover. You can't leave them, you know, so. But, um, whoops, let me go back a minute. Um, that's all right. Um, at, at any rate, at 9-11, I got, I was in Chicago, I get in the cab, the sirens start going, they think that the, you know, one of the tall buildings is going to be next, and when I paid, we were hit in the back, and I had the door open, so I was thrown out on the sidewalk, um, broke my arm, and dislocated my shoulder, went on to the hospital and the, you know, ambulance, and I called Fortune had told them what had happened. And they said, can you do it tomorrow? We're under deadline. <laughs> and I'm like, of course I can do it tomorrow. Um, at any rate, it's a good story. My son loved this job I did for Absolute. May, I, some of you may own that book, the art book on the Absolute campaign. They had Warhol and all of this. At any rate, the reason my son loved it so much is that not only did I get well paid, but they delivered three cases of... <laughs> a vodka to our studio so it became my, my son's uh... so here are just some of the covers I did um, and I worked a lot in Japan in the 90s Japan had so much money and they couldn't wait to have me working for them and they treat you so well I mean a lot of the American uh, assignments that I had that, weren't, that were advertising um, they, like with IBM or, or uh, Estee Lauder or something like that, they want you to, they have these, these meetings, the marketing meeting, and they, they basically tell you paint by numbers. We need this. This will work. At any rate, in Japan, they would just like, they would tell you, we hired you because we love your style. Just do what you think is best. And that was such a brilliant thing. But... And these are some of my covers. I have done 17 books. I think anyone who knows me knows that I am driven. I have been driven since, gosh, I learned to read early because I had two older sisters. So I, I was the only kid to read every book in the Weston Library. And so, you know, the kids' library. I used to walk there because I could walk there. And my mother never had her driver's license, so I had to walk. Now, because we've talked about it a lot, wise women, I have a little video for you. But what I loved about this book so much is I went to 30 cities. That was what I wanted. And even though I was with Time Warner Publishing and got it $10,000 advance, that doesn't last too long when you're going to 30 cities, right? So I had been teaching, because while I was doing all this, I always was teaching part-time. And so I had students everywhere. And so every city, I did a trade. I'll give you a print if you let me stay with you, even if it's on a couch, and help me find some older women that you think are fabulous in your city. And so it worked. Um, but I loved it because I would say, honestly, I wanted to be best friends with at least 95% of them. They were that interesting. Oh, we have a video. And it has a music track, so I won't talk too much. Shane, it's not, it's not for some reason, they, but we need the sound up, please. I love this, and I use a laser for a double exposure. I love her. She was a teacher. Is she not, like, can't you see that inner integrity? You all know that. Yeah, Gloria Steinem. 
I have stories for all of these. I wish I had more time to tell you. There she was in Sweden. Three stories. Can you imagine how thrilled I was inside of myself? I met this woman at a wedding and thought her face was handsome. And she wanted to pose nude because she said, I want to show people how I'm still beautiful even after a mastectomy. Dame Judy Dench, she said, being a Quaker helped me. With all the awards I've gotten, what I realized, it's all nothing. It's your friends, your family. She's another amazing poet. And Miss Birdie, oh, I fell in love. And her name, I'll tell you a little bit more about later. And oh, I wanted uh, Credit Scott King so badly for this book. I'll tell you that story too. I waited six months for her. And look at this. She told me this is a ring for fertility. And she said, you never know these days. <laughs> at any rate. I'm just going to, because we had to go so quickly, tell you a few little stories. I'm going to read this because I interviewed them all. And I, th I thank the nuns who taught me how to read and write. You couldn't get out of there without being a good writer. Oh, guess what? Your knuckles would be nothing. All right. So I, l I didn't use a, uh, you know, any recording device. I just sat with them. She said, I used to dance a lot, but unfortunately all my partners are dead. Now I travel to remote villages around the world where women weave their own cloth. I design all my clothes and try to keep the integrity of the cloth. I like hats, which she made. This one makes me feel like a mythic priest that brings joy and love to people around me. Zelda Kaplan, age 85. At any rate, her husband died. She was living in Florida. and She had always wanted to be an artist in New York, so she got a studio in Soho, and she did her thing. Jane Goodall, she told me to tell my readers that she travels 300 days a year now. And she couldn't have done that when she was younger. She had family, and, but she has a message to get out, and she does it 300 days a year. Jessica Tandy said, you won't want to photograph me. I'm having chemo, I have no hair. I said, Miss Tandy, I can assure you, you will be even more radiant and beautiful. She said, if you think so, I love that picture, and I loved her. I love her hands. She's like a bird. Um, there's Miss Birdie again. I just got to know her, and uh, her. she didn't have children, so she had this wonderful friend that was in a high-rise next door to her. And I love Betty Silverstein. She gets stopped now, and people tell her how gorgeous she is. Geraldine Smith. She said, I don't need a mirror to see how I look. Long ago, I realized the inner self is visible if you present yourself truthfully and authentically. I'm comfortable with getting older. I've lived a good life. Gorgeous. My next door neighbor, there were four people in a two bedroom apartment. The grandmother, Lola, her granddaughter, and the couple. I saw them all the time. I used to feed their cat when they went out of town. And when she passed away, her daughter, her granddaughter told me that she wanted that picture at her memorial. So these are the kind of relationships. Gloria Steinem missed her appointment with me and she called and said, oh gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Can you make it on Sunday morning? I said, I work seven days a week. Of course I can make it. And she ended up staying two hours. We both talked about how our life had been all about fulfilling the dreams of our mothers who had never gotten a chance. How many of you had a mother who wasn't able to fulfill her dreams? Or a relative? Yes. I wanted Coretta so badly. 
And how I got all the celebrities was to write a uh, letter to all of them, FedEx it, and the subject was no book called Wise Woman would be complete without Coretta Scott King. <laughs> and of course, they never read it. It was read by their you know, manager, personal assistant, and his name was Charlton. And I got to be very friendly with Charlton. He kept me on a string, waiting six months. And finally, I sent him a case of very expensive champagne, and I called him. I said, did you open the bottle, the case of champagne I sent uh, FedEx yesterday? Because this is your last chance. <laughs> You've got to get me in. He's, and we, we, we started laughing with each other. He was just a charming guy. She's just too busy. He said, okay, you come to Atlanta. She's doing a keynote for the Nursing Association of America. I can get you into the green room. I said, I'll be there. And she was a delight. I told her I, I promised three minutes. She said, oh, forget that. I'm not ready to go on. You stay as long as you want. And I had rehearsed an idea because I had never met her, and I saw her in all those newsreels, you know, in the, you know, her church, and I wanted her to do that, so I practiced with my assistant before the slow shutter drag uh, that I needed to do, so I was able to do that very quickly. At any rate, it was worth every minute of it. And Cicely Tyson, how fabulous. But this was the last image in the book. And I met her standing in line at a, uh, because I wanted to go to uh, assisted living um, and nursing homes as well to include all you know demographics. She was standing in line at 4.30 like some of your older relatives may have done. And I approached her and I, I said, I'm you know, Joyce Tennyson, I'm here doing a book on wise women. And I had the cover mocked up so I could approach people. That's another secret of mine. Um, and I said, I would love you to be part of this book. You just have such an amazing radiance to you. She said, oh, no, I hate to have my picture shown, uh, taken. I said, honestly, 30 seconds. So I walked her over. There was a chair. I had two little lights set up. And I just said, you know, I'm interviewing people. You know, what would you like to tell my readers about your long 90 some odd years. She said, oh, Miss Tennyson, I'd have nothing important to say. And I said, Elva, just close your eyes. And when you open them, I'm going to take one picture. I have my... And she said, okay. She opened her eyes and she said, I can still remember what it feels like to love with all my heart. Will that do? I mean, hello. I mean... Those are the kind of things that, that I was lucky enough. And you know what? Saks Fifth Avenue heard about this book. They did all their windows up and down uh, Fifth Avenue for Mother's Day, and they threw a big party for us. Look at the women here, Miss Birdie. Oh, I photographed two nuns that I met standing in line for a peace uh, lecture. Uh, just look at how happy they were to come. And how happy I was to have 6 Fifth Avenue pick up the tab. <laughs> I've had four relationships, permanent live-in relationships. I do like people, men too, very much, actually. So, and, um, yes, that's right. Um, and some nice Europeans, might I say. Um, oh, I'm teasing you. All right. But my partner, who was a Brit, uh, uh, passed away about uh, 14 years ago. And just, you know, heart attack, uh, whatever. He was a head of the Royal Shakespeare Company for 12 years and a, and a uh, you know, a, 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 what do you, yeah, he, was, he was just fabulous. At any rate. My son said to me, why are you living in New York all by yourself when you could be up here with me and my kids? And so uh, I said, you find me the house and I'll be there. So I moved my whole archive into Maine. And uh, ah, I was in a little tiny studio and I had to, 
I know. I had to, you know how people live in New York. Um, I, mean, I had a two bedroom, which the FedEx man was very impressed with. Oh, Miss Tennyson, this is like a sanctuary. So beautiful. And I'm like, oh, thank you. You know, but it was not this. Um, uh, it was in Chelsea before Chelsea was Chelsea. And, um, but now you're going to see what it really looks like. All the boxes of, uh, these are the Polaroids that I talked about. Um, are, you know, all stored in uh, archival boxes and all that. And uh, it's my assistants. Here I am a couple weeks ago, surrounded by all this work. Don't you feel sorry for me? Because guess what? I have to organize it before I leave this planet. This is a big job for me. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. I, I like to tease. But at any rate, uh, when I got to Maine, I thought, I don't want to photograph people anymore. I did my best work then. I'm just not going to, I'm just going to wait. And so I edited a book that first year, because I like editing books. And all of a sudden, one morning at 5, because I you know, wake up early, this fog rolled in over the harbor. And it was like the backdrops I used to paint to be in the studio. And I thought, Oh my God, thank you, thank you, because you know what? I saw the book, I saw the traveling show, I saw it all in my head, and all I had to do was do it. And I had, this was a great um, experience. And Holden Luntz has been very successful at having some of the really large images on metal. Yes, I... So Holden has done a very good job with these trees, I'll tell you. Love me, love Enjoy. Me. It's a quick little video. Say you do. All of these were shot with 20 mile radius of my place. Let me fly in away with you. I see them like people. We are creatures of life cycle and the beauty can be age that's the archetypal main tree right but some of them almost could be in Europe the birch is archetypal main a.m. at a golf course near I hear the sound of mandolin look at that I mean oh my gosh that shape kiss me with your kiss my love again. tree of life
I took them. I hear the sound of mandolins and you. Apples, oh, and in Maine they freeze and look so beautiful. have a regional hospital and they had a new building and they asked they commissioned me to use the gold trees because they were from Maine and they thought it they would make the help make the parents feel less anxious in the large rooms the where you wait and all of that it was a really hard job for me I'd never done anything like that and it was all worth it. And the trees went to China. Look how large the trees are. I was invited to be in a wonderful show um, there. And uh, as you can see, it was at the Temple of Heaven, which is a World Heritage Site. And they actually flew me over. So there are some perks. <laughs> I didn't have a chance for you to look at the images that were in the show in Sweden, so I'm just going to go through some of those that you haven't seen, but in that same book, Transformations, this was the cover. This is a muse I had. Um, I met her on the subway one day, and I approached her. I always have cards, as some of you noticed with me, and I had the... Uh, I introduced myself and asked if I could photograph her. And it turns out she's Swedish. So that's, I felt like she was a younger sister. And this is the photograph that appeared on the cover of American Photo that opened the door for me in terms of, um, you know, really making a livelihood. I couldn't have really stayed in New York if that hadn't happened. So thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. And there she is again. This was, I've always had a problem with anxiety, which I sometimes hide better than other times. And I've taken a lot of workshops to control it and meditation and all of that. And there was one exercise I did is I trained myself when I got really anxious to imagine myself in a bubble of light. And that helped me a lot. So I thought, well, why can't I bring that into my photos? So I taught myself how to use a laser as a second exposure. And this is what you're seeing in some of the pictures. I feel like it gives it another kind of energy, another kind of, uh, you know, radiance. And, and I've always tried to photograph people of all different uh, colors and shapes and sizes. And I was very much aware of that. Um, and, you know, with portraits and with children, I don't want to flatter anybody. Why would anybody serious want to do that? I want to show something unusual about... And this girl had been abused, and I found out from her mother that the husband was dragging her down the stairs by her hair, and the girls were watching it. And I said, you have to get into that guidance counselor at the school and you have to tell her what you've just told me and get this taken care of, and she did. And it worked out for the girls and it worked out for her, for her at any rate. I always was fascinated by this art historical uh, Manet's Olympia. And the reason it made such an uproar in Paris in 1863 is because answer the question, what is she doing that women didn't do before that in a painting? Looking directly in the camera. Or, right? She's strong, and she doesn't care 
if she shows it. She's not an object. She's not a muse. Or if she is, she's got the controls. I went to a Picasso um, retrospective that maybe some of you went at the Gu to at the Guggenheim. I think it was only five or six years ago. In every floor as you go down, there was a new muse, all of whom had, you know, had a uh, obviously intimate relationship, and then he moved on to the next muse. We do, uh, at any rate, so I thought, why don't I do an update of that with a woman of color looking directly into my lens? I used to try to challenge myself in doing some things that were fun. Um, She's amazing, right? This woman had alopecia, and I saw her in the bank, and I approached her and asked if I could photograph her. And I actually, uh, I had this frame that I, I used to get things at flea markets and stuff, and I decided, oh, it would be great to just paint a, a cloud on there. And at any rate, I, I love it just because I remember her, and we became close friends, and this is Suzanne again. That was a, I, I saw this swan in a taxidermy place, um, and I thought, I've got to get this and do something with it. Now, I'm living in Maine. I have that wonderful uh, studio on the lower floor. And I thought, but what am I going to do to, you know, I'm a workaholic. My partner will tell you, anybody who's ever known me. I work six and a half, seven days a week, really all the time. And so I thought, I have an attic that's unfinished, so I'll make a meditation room. And it has a beautiful view of Rockport Harbor. Now, I'm not exactly the early American type. Uh, so I wasn't, I couldn't find a, a mantle that I wanted up here. So I went to some salvage places, and this was a mirror, and the mirror was broken um, from Bhutan. And of course, it was very inexpensive. And I brought it, had it taken to the studio and the construction guys, I said, could we, you know, build this out? Um, he said, well, Joyce, if anyone could, you could. I mean, so let's do it. At any rate, this is nice. And so I have used to do um, classes, um, our women's retreats, and uh, not since COVID, though. Now, during COVID, was I going to sit there twiddling my thumbs? No. So I decided to do another um, book. Uh, I'd done two other flower books that I enjoyed. But with this one, I wanted to show something that I thought I had done with people that I'd never done with flowers. And that's the soul of flowers. So um, just sit back and enjoy. This is a short little three-minute And it's, it's the layout of the book. So you'll see, this is the front and back cover. And so, the, you know, you really, when you're laying out a book, you have to be very, very careful. What's on the right page affects what's on the left page. And I can spend days trying to figure that out for every spread I work on. Like this detail of that flower, small. It's a felt balance. So think about an adjective that you would use to describe this new, the, the flowers in this book, just to see if we can be interactive here a little bit. Yes, thank you. She's got it right away. Now, this 
plenty of other things. I worked so hard on this book. I was not getting it in the beginning, and I was just so angry at myself. And I've always loved writing, of course, um, and reading, and was able to marry some wonderful quotes with this, too. I love it. Thank you. Deep in their roots, all flowers keep the light. And we do too, don't we? This is a hydrangea leaf that I watched go through its cycle. And it was so beautiful. I think Holden has that in his gallery. It's my favorite of all the flowers. A flower blossoms for its own joy. Isn't that profound? That's its mission in life. This is the cover. Look deep into nature and then you will understand everything better. Einstein, he was smart at everything, let's face it. The Buddha said, if we could see the miracle of a single flower daily, it would change the world. I love those. Uh, at any rate, what can I say? Chinese lanterns, yes. Dostoevsky said, beauty will save the world. And I would like you to think about that. I'm sure you're all here because you love art. And uh, sorry, I'm being guided here. To I was told that this I should see as a lollipop because I get so excited. I start talking like this. I'm teasing and making fun of myself. Um, but at any rate, I hope you had a little journey yourselves, and we'll talk to others about it. Meanwhile, I know they want to serve dessert now, but I would be happy to take any comments or questions or, yes, one right here. Okay, the question was cameras. You know what? I had that big Polaroid the whole time I was in New York, but I, I was lucky Canon USA has supported me for 20 years and I use all their equipment. But you know, they're the same. You've got a good cam. It's not the camera. It is the brains behind it yeah. and the soul behind it. It's, yeah. I, you know, we're all using our iPhones. Um, I'll get you next. I saw this lovely lady there. Oh, thank you. Very moving. Thank you. And the word that comes to me is spirituality. But have you ever thought of I have, and I have a slideshow of that. I could have shown you today if we had had enough time. Yes. Yes, I, and I loved doing it. Thank you. And, well, photographs of the sky and clouds, because they are so spiritual. And so I, I yes. Um, but, you know... At any rate, Holden Luntz does some wonderful gallery talks if you get on his mailing. And I'm going to get him to do something next year or maybe later. I'd love to show that video of my clouds. All right. Okay. At any rate, somebody here? Oh, sorry, Larry. Thank you. Uh, other than King Hussein, I didn't see any other men. Well, you and know I what? Feel, I feel very rejected and left out. Well, that's, that's, that's right. Okay, do you know what? After Wise Women was the best-selling book of the year. Um, I mean, n under Stephen King, but photo book, yes. Um, they asked me to do a, a book on men. And I said, I'm just not as good with them. I can do professional shots. But the thing is, in the end, my photos are all about me. They are. They're about the other people, but it's... I'm connecting with them on a, 
on a spiritual level. Um, and I, as I told you, I love men. And guess what? They upped their, their uh, price. Uh, I got a really bad contract for wise women. 5%. Oof. Yeah, that hurt. Yes. But at any rate, I did the book. It sold fairly well, 25,000 copies, nothing to sneeze at. But it doesn't float my book because it's not, it, it, it's, it's just professional. It's like looking at Forbes magazine or I, I, something. I just think we're deprived because you're so wonderful in what you do that I'd love to see what you do. Well, anyway, well, you're not going to do it. So. You know what I would like? <laughs> you know what, what might tempt me is men over... Well, you know, I think men become so interesting as they age because a lot of that outer veneer of, you know, often fake power and ego, it does reduce us all. I mean, you know, I'm in my 70s. I'm seeing it. Um, well, to be continued, sweetie. Okay. Yes. Yes. Beautiful presentation. Thank you. Lovely, gorgeous. Thank you. But I, I um, worked hard. Okay, I know you did. Um, <laughs> what you were doing, you were being a pioneer women, woman. You were showing women's, you commingled women's vulnerability and showed it as a, a power mode. Thank you. And, uh, you, you know, you were the first to ever do this. And also, men used to always objectify women's nudity. And you made women's nudity a source of strength and power. And you, you were pioneered a whole Thank you, era sweetie. from that. If Gagosian could only see that, yeah, I'd that's be what in you did. Good luck. That's what you yeah. did. And I have one quick question. How did you get all that cloudy effect? What did you do technically? Well, you know what? Painted all the backdrops. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the cloudy double exposures. Double exposures. Thank you. You made my day. All of you made my day. Do you know that? Because I wanted this... I, you know, it's not my ego that wanted it to go well. It's just that I don't want to do something if it's not going to be the best I can do. And, and yeah, and I want to, you know, so I, I mean, thank you to Shane here, who was my audiovisual guy who has been a, a friend of mine through my teaching for what 10 years now so I just Shane came over on Sunday we're satting we sat at my you know like uh, laptop I did the what I wanted to do the run through I had all these ingredients and he helped me stitch it together and so thank you it, and, um, Th thank you, Joyce. Thank you, Shane. Hi. I just um, am blown over by your presentation. I must say it was sensational. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm curious, and I'm not sure you can answer my question, because it may be confidential. That is the answer. But who might it have been uh, that gave you the review that said, to female, quote, unquote? Well... Uh, it was a uh, Washington a reporter, and his name I can still remember, um, Steve Apple. And you know what? I was doing a lecture years later, and he came up and he introduced himself. He said, you may not remember me. And he said, but my daughter goes to Savannah College of Art, and I would love her to get to be able to be one of your interns. I know you only accept three, three a semester. Bravo. At any rate, I was very gracious to him. And I said, I said thank you. for. He, he said, I, I feel such regret about that review I did. You probably don't remember it, he said. And I was, you know what? Best thing you could ever have done. It got me to New York. And at any rate. I don't hold any grudges, but good question, darling. Did you give the daughter an internship? I didn't because there were people that had better qualifications. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the question is about the background of trees. 
It's all fog. And yes, and so you can't order that up. You have to be ready at five in the morning when it rolls in. And it is like that. And what it does, you could, there could be a house in the background and you can't see it. So that was the magic. Oh, now there's the story. Good, good question. Gold, actually, if you go to Holden Luntz's gallery, um, what I did first is that I, in my mind, when I do a series, I see it hanging in a gallery. And I thought, I don't want this just on paper. I want this to glow. After my partner died, I went to um, Peru. And I was captivated by the fact that they had a lot of gold statuary. And it was their way of communicating with the divine, not in a materialistic way, but in a spiritual way. And I thought to myself, when I saw that, that fog coming in, and I saw some of the pictures from my Canon camera on my computer screen, I thought, I want them to be gold. I've got to learn how to do that. So it took me a year and a half in a smart assistant's help. Um, smart male assistant's help. Uh, who is still, all these years later, one of my best friends. It was like a second son. At any rate, he came to visit us and stayed for five days with his girlfriend. Those are the kind of things that, you know, I remember. At any rate, I taught myself how to do gold. And then um, the galleries loved it. But then I wanted to do bigger. And I couldn't do that because it's very labor intensive. So now I'm outputting on metal. And um, Holden um, has those. If you ever have friends visiting you, I suggest you go by um, and uh, take a look. I'd even come. If you bring some friends, just let me know. I'll be right over. <laughs> no, I do, I do like people. I hope you see that. She says that she liked the flowers, and she wanted to know how I did them. So I'll tell you exactly how I did them. And it's so easy, in a way. But guess what? Six months of dogged failure. During COVID, locked in that studio that you saw, cluttered with, I don't never call my flowers dead, I don't use that word, that have finished their cycle everywhere. And I got so frustrated that I, you know, was starting to, you know, like get music on in the background that my partner doesn't like. But in the day, he has a studio, so he goes away, 8.30 to 4. And I have the whole place to myself, and I do whatever I want, playing my own music. I'm teasing, making fun of myself, I hope you know. At any rate, and so I started dancing with the flowers. I thought, I'm just going to dance with these flowers, damn it, you know? Uh, and I started to get this energy, and I started moving them around. And then, I don't know whether you saw in that behind the scenes shot, that table where I had the flowers, but you know, so I'd start picking them up. Long exposure, what happens when you pick something up? Move it, blurry. blurry, but whatever. And then I thought, oh, this is nice. I like the way this looks. I'm gonna try a double exposure. Sorry, I hit that, uh, Shane. But at any rate, maybe it's, uh, you could turn the music off and they can look at it. Yeah, but at any rate, thank you, Shane. Okay, Joyce? Yes. Let me, there's one thing I wanna talk about. Yes. Tell us about the film they're making of you. Oh, yes. Ooh, I have, uh, a group uh, making a documentary on me. It's been brutal. Brutal. <laughs> you don't know how hard it is to be photographed for a documentary at my age. And they wanted all the secrets. Uh, well, they're editing it now, and hopefully it will be on PBS. Wow. Dale well, will tell you. Maybe she'll do it. I think it'd be anyway. fabulous. Yeah. That's going to be exciting. Oh, God, Is, you've seen nothing yet. <laughs> Is there any other questions? Okay. Question? Uh, I 
Well, you know, teaching. You know what? I could do a private one, possibly. So, I mean, if I do, I'll let Dale know. Um, but I haven't, I haven't committed to any at the moment. But thank you. Yes. Oh yeah, the, was, the question was about film base. Yes, the minute I could get away from that dark room, you have to realize that I was the lead 101 photo instructor for several years. That meant locking yourself into a tiny room and helping them roll the film onto the at contraption. Oh my God, the sweat. The, you know, no, I'm teasing, but I couldn't wait to get rid of the dark room. I had a huge dark room in DC where I did those hand applied several emulsion pictures, which Holden also has those white on white ones. Yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Um, so yes, no, I found in DC, I taught alternative process, which is, you know, like cyanotypes or, you know, when you see a photo that really looks different and it's on a different kind of a paper or something, it's alternative process. And so I taught that. And um, I taught myself how to apply the silver that they put on the paper in a factory with a paintbrush. And that's what gave that photo of my son that people liked, um, which is very white on white. I did a whole book of that. And those were 22 by 30 inches and very ethereal like that. Right, Holden? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're interested in her art, is she selling the books right here? Oh, yes. I've Listen, we have the most nice, the most wonderful guy from the local book stand up here. He's got he's got wise women, um, and he has a few that are out of uh, print as well. And there are a few of the flower book left. They're out of print, but at any rate. Oh yeah, I mean I use my cell phone for work all the time. I mean I'm sure you all do, and and don't degrade it. A lot of fancy photographers are using their cell phones almost ex exclusively because the resolution is so good now. Yes, yeah. Okay, this is a good question. And this is the way the, the documentary movie may open. She asked me, where do I get my inspiration? I'm moving back here because I feel like I neglected some people in the back. Um, but Growing up, I did not have a really happy family. A lot of anger and stuff. So I used to go into nature. We lived, those of you who know Weston, and my friends right, my new friends here, it's near that reservoir. Remember that beautiful, it looks like a big pond. And um, I would go there, and I would write poetry, and I would make little origami boats and I would launch those little origami boats onto what was the reservoir, but that looked like a pond. So for me, nature and living in New York City for 25 years in a dumpy apartment where the only view, even though the FedEx man thought it was really great, um, I looked, my view was at another apartment building with boxes, a storage place. Nature has always been there for me from an early age. And the documentary movie does a reenactment of me in the winter when I was having a bad day. It opens up and we have a younger, like a nine-year-old girl stepping in for me. I read from my journal. And that journal is about how some of the most memorable days of my youth were when it would snow and I would go into the woods and what I would do with those trees 
that are mostly fir trees, right? We're talking Maine, and I'd lift them up. And those of you who have been any New England town, what happens when you lift up the branch? The, the, the snow goes down, but it springs up. It has its freedom again. And I would do that. I would do that on both sides of the woods, and then I'd lie down, and I would scream my name. Because guess what? I was the luckiest person in the world to be named Joyce Tennyson. And every teacher I ever had said, with a name like that, you're bound to be what? An artist. Anyway, thank you, Joyce. All thank right. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I bow to you. This was one of the most fun lectures I've had. You were a great audience, and you made my month. So thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> You're welcome.